And we're back with the Space Ghost Real Estate Show. Another quality episode brought to you by all of our friends here on the Space Coast, including myself, Jesse Hall with EXP Realty, John with Move It Mortgage, LoanApplyApproved.com, and Michelle <laughs> Carpenter. Inspiring home staging and redesign. That's right. And together, we are the Space Coast Real Estate Show. Thank you so much for joining us. And as we fade out, we have uh, our guests in the studio. This is our first guest. We haven't mo- like really had guests um, in the first few episodes, so this is kind of exciting. And today, we're actually going to be talking about something that I believe is still on a lot of homeowners' thoughts. I mean, especially if you're uh, someone who's sensitive to our ecosystem and, and things of that nature. Uh, we're welcoming Jake. He is the um, manager of the conversation conversation conservation conservation <laughs> conservation manager with a Brevard Zoo Brevard Zoo just just uh I just noticed guys uh they were recognized as a sixth best best zoo and I can't speak today sixth best zoo we nationwide love Brizard, Brevard Zoo we love it mm-hmm. Brevard Zoo is um it's a I great facility kids, so yes and and of course the kids love it big kids at heart love it Yep. Mm-hmm. Likewise. If you haven't been go, uh, if you haven't been in a while because of COVID, go back because we just went last weekend and they've had all, added a lot of new exhibits. They do things. have a lot of new exhibits. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I really going enjoy, on. Yeah, always. I, I enjoy the kangaroos. Me yes, too. Yes. Yeah, the kangaroo new exhibits giraffes. always fun. You like the giraffes or oh, like we, J- Jake different. and I pre-show were like how. How are the giraffes just like breeding? It seems like there's always like a new baby because <laughs> they're happy over there. Yes, they are happy. <laughs> they're and, happy. And so well we're ex- for. we're exploring <laughs> why spring. why uh, animals in captivity too. may procreate more than other breeds, mm. and um, and it's it's just because they're happy. They have the the, the, the land. They have the the a generous venue. They have full to, bellies. So mm-hmm. yeah, I mean I think no predators. I think everybody it's stressful. Exactly. I think everybody. <laughs> And uh, and I'm not sure how many tons of lettuce they eat, but all I know is every time I go, I, I serve a bushel to a couple of them, you know, and, and that's probably one of the most fun things you'll ever do because you're like 20 feet up off the air and these guys are just like reaching up and, you know, they got these tongues that'll just come and wrap. <laughs> probably their, as much lettuce oh. as I eat. Yeah, right. <laughs> a full romaine in one gulp. <laughs> like they, th- anyway, I, we, we, we really love it. Um, and, and it's more than that. The, the zoo does so much more for us here locally they have a couple other projects i'm not sure if jake's going to be you know have the liberty to talk about it um but they are so involved and we're so we're just we're just so over the top to have uh, brevard zoo in the house and talk about what's going on uh not just conservation wise but also uh zoo wise so jake why don't you introduce yourself um and tell us like how long you've been there and why you love the zoo yeah well thank you guys for having me today Mm -hmm. the Zoo is happy to be in Brevard County. I mean, we're a community-built zoo. That, yes. That's really part of our, our DNA is, is being built by the community exactly. and keeping those ties in the schools and with our, our local families. So it's just, it's been a wonderful opportunity uh, for us here in the last 26 years that we've been in the area. And, and how long you been with them? I've been with the zoo for five years. So wow. I'm, I'm, as intro, I'm Jake Zender, conservation manager with Brevard Zoo. So you can spit it out better than yep. I can. Yep. <laughs> Uh, so I, say <laughs> I say it all the time. I say it all the time. So I love the zoo because we we obviously have this this footprint, and people come mm. to have this experience with animals in a really intimate setting where they right. can get close. And the the exhibits, the habitats feel very natural. Um, but we we have this this public face that people see a lot. But mm. we also do a, a lot of conservation work locally mm. and internationally. Um, and I think that's something that guests are kind of maybe vaguely familiar with Mm -hmm. um i do think we had a period there for about 10 years where every elementary school kid in brevard county made like an oyster mat like at least once right sometimes five times depending on if their teacher was really into it um so we did have these little touches in the community Mm -hmm. um in some of our local conservation work um but we also have a, a portion of every admission and every membership goes to international and local conservation projects where they come to Brevard Zoo, which is not a huge facility in right. terms of like, you know, national zoos. And we've, you know, putting our money where our mouth is and giving money to other organizations to do good work all over, you know, from the Florida Wildlife Hospital here in town right. to groups in Madagascar and Borneo and India mm. and all over the place. I mean, you guys rehab 
hurt manatees, sea turtles. You guys are always releasing something into the back yeah. into the ocean. It seems the turtle like crawl. Yeah. yeah, you know. So there's always. I mean, it sounds like there's always something in the news regarding Varda Zoo in one way or another. You know, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah so we we try and fill whatever the local need is, and that's. Mm-hmm. That's really the origins of our conservation story Right, um, is there were opportunities where they needed help and right. we stepped in to kind of fill that role. And the Sea Turtle Healing Center is a great example of right. that in that, you know, the Sea Turtle Preservation Society and other groups were having to drive like a hundred you know, plus miles sometimes to get to a facility. Well, the nearest one's like a SeaWorld. Yeah. You know? And then there's one way further south, like Gumbo Limbo, mm-hmm. way down south. And so we, you know, got the community together and we got a gracious donation um to build a yes. world-class veterinary center and you know sea turtle rehabilitation mm-hmm. facility and now we do a bunch of sea turtle releases yeah uh john michelle any um any fun memories of of the the zoo with the kids or anything else well yeah i got two kids so um we'd love to go to the zoo and mm-hmm. as you know as often as we can and also they have the zip lining there yeah. too that we so uh, the, we enjoy the treetop the tree yeah, top. tree track. Track. track that was that's the tongue twister that was new yes like that's only like what four years old i think it's a bit older it's than that is it really yeah. it's it is. actually say, 10 or 12 i was gonna say it was around 12. 2011 uh-huh. 2012 i, feel I think root, it got not, finished yeah <laughs> i feel even more guilty for not enjoying it yet have you guys done that i, I have, have not. i even did well, the black not. diamond with the black son, yeah. Yeah. I have twice. You have okay. twice. And I work there, so right. I, I, sh- I should go more, <laughs> <Right>. apparently. <laughs> we first moved here in 2010, and my son was in sixth grade. So that summer, um, he pr- he attended one of the camps that they have for the school-age children during the summertime. And so he was able to go canoeing, and mm-hmm. they did do the zip line, but he was still a little shy at that time and did right. not. Um, <laughs> so he did not participate with that. But it's a great opportunity for the kids during the summertime for the zoo camps. I'm assuming y'all still have those. I think mm-hmm. I saw some we advertisements do. on that. In, in person and virtual, and if, virtual. if that's cool. your speed. Yeah, so um, he was really, that was our first, you know, we just moved to Florida. So that was really a good intro, um, introduction to Florida, Florida wildlife and things like that too. So yeah. that's a great thing for people moving into the community. My daughter's school goes there every year on yeah. like a field trip and yeah. I always tell my baby girl to let me know because I want to be the chaperone. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're still doing some night hikes with the education department so nice. you get kind of the, the zoo after dark oh, yeah. um, and of Those course summer cool. camps and things. Yeah, it's a, it's a totally different experience obviously because there's, there's plenty of nature that just is on the zoo property that is right. not you know we it's not under our care right <laughs> it's just the owls and snakes and turtles and everything that are just kind of oh. hanging out on the property speaking of that is does does that have any um i mean there, there's no there's no gators eating any of the the zoo animals or anything like that right? no okay. so we, we do have the odd gator get in from the right. wetlands oh. adjacent but it's the yeah. little guys yeah. and so okay. they hang out for a few days and then we you catch them and put them back somewhere else es- es- escort yeah. them back yeah um, nothing big enough to be concerned about your no sa- I, your I, safety is okay I'd hate, i hate to <laughs> imagine like an owl would just like grab a meerkat yeah I mean, Ooh, like, fly away that'd be it. great like that's why they have the lookout yes they have that one poor s- sacrificial meerkat who stands up tall and mm-hmm. looks around all day yeah. for really? the hawks because that's one of the big predators out out uh, in africa would that be weird yeah <laughs> it's like to have that job yeah <laughs> isn't the meerkat <laughs> enclosure covered most of uh, it, or is it? I thought I thought it was it's partially o- it's open. open air. It does have yeah. a little yeah. open air. Yeah. Okay, I knew there were some yeah. parts of it. That the part it. where guests are is undercover. Okay. The parts where the meerkat are okay. open. Right. Yeah. We haven't had any issues. Good, good. Kids, <laughs> it's okay. No yeah. meerkat has not been harmed in this podcast. <laughs> yeah. uh, Which is surprising. Yeah. <laughs> we, surprising. We don't want to sing the Circle of Life song. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's African species. It does tie or with it, it does yeah. tie, yeah. 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 No, we try not to do that. <laughs> now, and you guys do have, like, other theme nights. You guys have, like, a jazz night. You guys have all kinds of other things. Talk about Ye- some of those. Yes. So those will be coming back around. Mm-hmm. We, t- we took a pretty big step back, as you'd imagine, during as, COVID. As with everybody. Uh, yeah. yeah. Everybody <laughs> experienced mm-hmm. this. You know, it's you can talk about it with everyone because everyone experienced right. it. Um, but yeah, so Jazzu uh, is going to be coming up yeah, just... in, if we do it at the same time of year, November. Right. Um, so that'll have a couple different musicians, a mm-hmm. um, bunch of local vendors for food and right. drinks. Um, and it's a super fun event. We we scaled it quite a bit back. Uh-huh. Um, but I think pre-COVID, we were probably around the 1,500 to 1,600 people coming for a, a one night. Nice. Um, it's Bonanza. always it's always yeah. on everybody's list to do. Oh, it's a party it's because a good time. it's 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 part gala, 
mm-hmm. but it's at the zoo. Mm-hmm. And again, it's music, so it's a concert. Yep. So it's like all those things. And that's one of your uh, fundraising opportunities, yes. correct? Yeah, the big the big fundraiser is Safari Under the Stars. That's the one, yeah. Yes. So that's the one that's more yeah. the gala feel. It's, right. it's a, you know, get dressed up, nice table, plated mm-hmm. food, all that fun stuff. Um, so that one we just did virtually. Mm-hmm. Um, that's usually around April. Right. Um, man, if our development department here, hears me quoting the wrong dates, I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm pretty sure. Um, so that one's, um, you know, big corporate sponsors right. and local businesses that are just super generous and, and support the zoo and mm-hmm. a, a great opportunity to have some fun. And we usually have a, an awesome um, special guest, whether yeah. it's uh, Jeff Corrin a few years back or Jack Hanna or Tony Stewart, you know, from NASCAR, you know, yes. right, whoever it is, we get somebody fun. Yeah. Yeah, people love the Brevard Zoo. I mean, the Brevard Zoo, I think, is of all the people who, you know, are, uh, you know, have any kind of philanthropy and they have the the means to, to give back. They give to the Brevard Zoo over a lot of other local charities because of all the work that they've done and because they just they just love the facility. They love to be a part of it. Um Brevard Zoo gives back in so many different ways with education mm-hmm. and so forth. And again, conservation, which we're going to talk about because you're here. And this affects the residents of Brevard County as well. Mm-hmm. When we talk about the life of the goon, and I don't want you to become, you know, I, I, there, we get the MRC and other, other professionals in here to talk about the life of the goon. Uh, but it's an issue. And mm-hmm. it's a big issue. We just passed a tax not too long ago. Uh, we're constantly seeing the dredging from all the muck and everything else being reduced. We're constantly hearing about, you know, the conversion from uh, riverside uh, uh, properties that, that are within a certain uh, distance from the river, mm-hmm. uh, trying to be converted from a septic to now, you know, going to a sewer kind of thing. So there's a lot of improvements that are going on. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that people don't realize is the importance of oysters and other bivalves and mollusks and everything else and how they filter the water. What, what's, and, and again, we know the answer here, but what, what is that ambition and how does Brevard Zoo play into it? Yeah, so covered a lot of ground. So, yes, I know. So th- this is the great thing about Brevard County is that right. um, we've really taken hold of the situation mm-hmm. and are doing our very best to address it. Right. So there is some there's some money for lagoon restoration projects and water right. quality improvements from the state and federal government. And Brevard County, you know, did the, you know, hold my beer kind of a, a thing right, and right. went ahead and passed a half a billion dollars, not quite, mm-hmm. um, uh, sales tax. Right. 10 years long to fund, uh, you know, that initial push to right. get our lagoon where we needed to be in, in terms of water quality. Right. So, um, oysters and, and clams and bivalves in general, mm-hmm. and the natural systems that we have here, mangroves and seagrasses, right. they play a part in, in cycling nutrients naturally and removing them from the mm-hmm. system. And so they are funded through that, that, um, half cent sales tax, the save right. our Indian river lagoon project plan. Right. We call it the Sorrel Plan because the government loves their acronym. Yes, they know. do. <laughs> so, Sorrel Plan, it's way too long to say the right, Save right. Our Indian River Lagoon Project Plan anytime you're talking to somebody. Um, but uh, a bunch of that plan is is covering um, muck dredging, removing nutrients. It's mm-hmm. got four, four pillars to the plan. Right. We'll cover those super quick. But to remove nutrient loads that are stuck in the system, nitrogen and phosphorus, that's basically stuck in the muck. Right. So muck dredging reducing new nutrients getting into the system in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's like you said, septic sewer, septic upgrades, stormwater pond, retrofits, baffle boxes. It's like the catch-all category. And we have, thanks to our great management here at the city of Melbourne, we have the largest baffle box this side of the Mississippi. Yeah, it's it's just right up uh, US 1. Yep. Um, It's not too far from my house. So, yeah. It's a great thing. Um, keeps a bunch of plastic pollution out of the lagoon as well, which is well, you know, and, and that's what baffle thing. boxes are supposed to do. You know, yep. I mean, if, if not to get into like weird engineering, but you know, <laughs> what it does is allow some of the sediment to fall without mm-hmm. going over. So you have several a series of boxes where the sediment's allowed to fall. The nutrients don't get into the river. Only the only the water, ideally, right? I mean, that's yeah. what we're trying to do. Yeah. So it's little compartments to catch all that stuff. Exactly. And they and, just pump it out. And th- thankfully, we have some of these other mitigation efforts mm-hmm. um but one of the last ones again is is the oyster mats yeah so so restoration is the third category right. and that is restoring the ability of the lagoon the natural systems to remove those nutrients right and heal itself so yeah so to speak mangrove living shorelines you know mangroves and grasses that are native to the area mm-hmm. oysters specifically and then 
there's the option down the road they're not funding it yet but to mm. add clams and seagrasses um when we think that there's an opportunity there yeah and and some some other uh ambitions from because i mean it seems like there's all kinds of different uh nonprofits who are mm-hmm. supporting all this effort you know i mean especially with the restoration um the marine resource council they're famous for you know adding um i mean you go there and get a a, a rain capture system yeah, I rain mean, barrel. Mm-hmm. the rain barrels i mean there's all kinds of different things that they're doing now and so for homeowners here there, there's a lot of options to be green I prefer seeing, and this is this would be great, right? Um, in an ideal world of seeing just the end of the use of these nutrients in general for landscaping purposes. Yeah. You know, phosphorus, nitrogen, heavy, heavy, um, you know, because the algae feeds on these things. And, and during a storm or anything else, they're released from the muck, again, which comes from the grass clippings, mm-hmm. falls to the bottom. And just to give people a little background, and it, and it's, and it has nowhere to go. And so when a storm does come or, or a tide or any kind of shift disturbs that muck, all those things are released. And then we start to see algae blooms, which, of course, have have just really bad. I mean, it's, it's toxic. Yeah. 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 So the, the things that your lawn loves to eat, the yes. nitrogen and phosphorus and fertilizer, is, as you said, the same thing that algae likes to eat. Right. And so Brevard County did pass a, a fertilizer ban, an ordinance, right. saying that you should not be putting down fertilizer from June 1st to September 30th. Yeah, the rainy season. Yeah, the rainy season in Florida. you literally apply it and it gets rinsed and it right, washes off. right yeah. off. Yeah, and so we have a number of of things that are working against us mm-hmm. in that regard is, right. you know, all, all water leads to the lagoon for the most part. Yes. So even if you're not near the lagoon, that storm water drain near your property is going to run right out. So it's not just the people on the canals um, no. that need to do their parts. It's everybody. That's why it's a blanket rule. I had a neighbor and he loves his lawn. And he blew the grass clippings straight into the storm drain where it says like a little picture of the yeah. fish. Yeah. And like goes, you know, it, it like discloses. This goes right to the and just it's so it's a lot of education. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so going back to, to I, my ideal world, I would just love to see zero escaping. Just, you yeah. know, if, if everybody could just use pavers or shells or sand or anything but lawn mm-hmm. because it's I, I just feel it's archaic. Yeah. People think it looks great, but it, it's. It's that 1950s look that that is like it's embodied. That, it's that nuclear yeah, minds, family yeah. kind of thing, you know. Yeah. It's just like just like, but like anything else, you know. Um, it's you know, ingrained. We, yeah, we don't the have grass is always greener. Yeah, yeah. white white picket fence, single yeah. family yeah. home. Yeah, you know, and, and, but 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 we're away from that. You know, we yeah. don't. You know, a lot lot of families to to survive. You know, it's a two income family. They don't really do the lawn themselves, so it's more just like someone who comes ar- around, like like a landscaping. Um, uh, uh, team and 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 they do all of the clippings and everything else and you know they're not going to care maybe for where those clippings go to you know some people blow it back into lawn some other people just may just leave it on the street and wait for the rain to just you know take it right down the drain um so it's just a very unfortunate concept and when we're trying to see the river get revitalized and and, in return i mean i'm not sure if that's that's something that we could hope for i really do but i mean is it and i'm not you're not supposed to have an opinion but i mean is there a way i mean is is oysters the answer in restoration it is a tool in our tool belt right so you know we didn't get here overnight Mm -hmm. we didn't get to the point where the lagoon is unhealthy right just because there aren't as many oysters as there should be sure sure it's it's an and problem right right we have muck and we have fertilizer and we have grass clippings and we have septic tank we have all these things that are contributing negatively to the lagoon's health yeah but on the positive side, we have a lot of tools in our tool belt to address right. these things. So oysters are not a silver bullet. Right. Muck dredging isn't a silver exactly. bullet. These are each pieces to address part of the problem. Right. So we like oysters because um, if you do it right, it's, it's a one and done. You build it and it's self-sustaining. Muck dredging or something else, you've, you've taken all those nutrients mm-hmm. out. And then they'll they'll collect again eventually, and you got to pull them all out right, again. Right, right. So in theory, the oysters you know are sitting there filtering, and doing their thing, breeding and, and proliferating over time, and they're just going to keep filtering and doing their their wonderful oyster thing. For someone who's never seen an oyster mat, it takes because I know there's like restaurants who participate in saving, yep, uh, the shells, and then it takes volunteers to then um, apply them and, and put them on what like a, a mesh. Um, yeah. Blanket or, or what does that look like? Yeah. So there's a, a 
a bunch of different techniques that people in the industry use mm-hmm. to do oyster restoration and put oysters out there and try and you know catch wild oysters and start having them grow and, right, and right. feed and, and eat algae and do all those things that we yes. want. Um, but the best material for them to grow on is other oyster shells. Mm-hmm. So um, we run the local branch of the Shuck and Chair program. Mm-hmm. It's based actually out of um, Marine Discovery Center in New Smyrna Beach. Cool. They started it, and it's to take this valuable material Mm -hmm. that normally just gets thrown in the trash. So local restaurants, we have 19 local restaurants in Brevard and a shucking house um, that contribute shell to the program. So we go around once a week. Um, Olivia from our team goes around in a big truck. We call it, they they (laughs) set their shell aside from all the folks who are eating. We collect it. We take it um, to a site where people won't mind the smell. And it sits there and kind of bakes in the sun and the yeah. ants and the rain and everything, clean it off. And then once it's nice and clean, a nice just, you know, kind of not quite fossilized shell material will mm. start there. And that's the building block um, for all the oyster projects, um, uh, ideally around the state. And one question I get a lot is, well, do oysters just find yeah. o- oyster shells? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. So mm-hmm. you take that shell material, you can tie it to mats like we've done up in Mosquito Lagoon with right. UCF for, you know, forever. Um, here, we'll put it in steel cages where there's an aquaculture mesh you can use mm-hmm. or you can stick it in concrete. There's different concrete right, designs right. you can use. So there's a bunch of different ways, but it's everyone's targeting the same mm-hmm. thing. You put out oyster shell right. and they build little oyster condos. It's the best, it's <laughs> the best thing, right? That's so, awesome. Um, they're broadcast spawners, so the males and females, uh-huh. you know, they sh- shoot their gametes into the water. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure I can say eggs and sperm into the yes. water, but yeah, okay. Yeah. It was biology terms. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Yeah. And so they fertilize in the water column, and they'll float around for a few weeks, and they're looking for other oysters, safety mm-hmm. in numbers. Right. They grow in, you know, dense patches, right? You don't want to be the one oyster there when, like, right. a sheep's head <laughs> rolls <laughs> by because yeah, yeah, you're done for, right? <laughs> so they'll, they'll be able to find that chemical signature of shells even mm-hmm. if there's no live oysters present nice. and the land wow, they'll, they'll glue down and then they're stuck there that's it they don't move again for the rest of their life so you're three weeks old four weeks mm-hmm. old and you got to pick your home for the rest of your life a lot of pressure yeah that I is mean, a lot you, of pressure you, you guys would understand better than most you know <laughs> right. you got to make this deal and that's your forever home yeah right <laughs> so yeah give me an oyster realtor Jesse. yeah yeah <laughs> I got a great shell yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> New on the market. Look at this man. Super clean. <laughs> right. Only one owner. <laughs> that's what part of the funny. river are you looking for? Yeah. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. Waterfront. And, yeah. and then. There's a lot of selling. These ones. are mortgage free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The affordable Dwellings. living. We're, um, and then. And then it, it, it's up to the homeowners who live on the rivers to participate? Yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting opportunity for mm-hmm. homeowners. Um, I, we have several opportunities for, for people throughout the county, yeah. but waterfront homeowners in particular have um, a different ability to impact the lagoon right. just because they're waterfront, right? Um, they have the most direct connection. They have the most direct ability to positively or negatively impact. And access. And access, some yeah. of the, Some of these river homes, I mean, John, I'm, I'm sure you've seen, well, even yep. Michelle, you know, we'll go to this, these beautiful homes on the river, and they got, like, 100 feet of, like, dock. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, on, like, a, on, on a large dock, like, how many different mats do you think that could support? So, what our technique is, is, well, we're... I should say per, pier, not yeah. really a dock. Yeah. And but, can yeah. it be, like, does it doesn't have to be on the main canal, or can it be down any waterway it, that's it depends brackish. okay yeah so so there's a few constraints obviously oysters are an estuarine species mm-hmm. so they do like the brackish water right. they don't mind a little hint of fresh but we can't like build in crane creek it's too right. fresh right okay right. or turkey creek you know once you're out of the mouth gotcha, there, gotcha. it's too fresh so um, we are looking for certain water quality we are mm-hmm. looking for certain flow okay they're stationary you know they're a filter feeder so mm-hmm. if right. their food doesn't come to them yeah they don't need that's it Right. So canals are pretty tough for them for that reason. Okay. Just not mm-hmm. a lot of water flow there for them. So they need a current. So some currents, a more open lagoon is mm-hmm. better. Um, there's plenty of algae for them to eat in most places, mm-hmm. as you'd yeah. <laughs> expect <laughs> if you so look at the, the water. Rivers? Yeah. Like yeah. So any, any boat ramps, piers, docks along the rivers? Yeah. It, any open water section of the lagoon mm-hmm. is generally good. Um, now we do try and target areas where we have a few more oysters that are looking for homes, mm-hmm. more baby oysters in the water column right. looking to attach and so that tends to be on kind of the southern half of the county so okay. south of Pinita, and then kind of 520 being we don't see very many oysters north of that gotcha so um a homeowner could say hey i'm interested in mm-hmm. you know 
having my property be considered right. uh, to host an oyster reef or hey, I'm interested in mangroves and, and marsh grasses as well. We'll do the whole shebang, right? We'll do right. mangroves and grasses and oysters. We'll just get it all, the whole right. suite of, uh, of natural elements. And the zoo would come out and um, evaluate the property so they mm. can have an idea of if it's going to be suitable. We don't mm. want to put tax dollars out there and Is not sure. have it work. Mm. Right. So um, after that, it gets um, proposed to the county. They mm. choose to fund it or not. It's okay. a, another great thing is that they have it set up. So it's not just the county commissioners. Right. It's also a citizen oversight committee. Exactly. So it's a dual approval process of both <laughs> local folks mm -hmm. with an invested interest or vested interest. Sure. And also our, our political leaders. Um, so it goes through two levels of approval. If it gets approved, then we have funding in hand and we'll do the whole process for the homeowner. So they, their piece of that, getting it for free, which is great for them right is that they are allowing us to put it on their property giving access to waterfront that would be very expensive for the county to purchase a bunch of waterfront right of course right. to to put in these projects so it's kind of a win-win the benefits the water quality improvements benefit everybody right. around them you know but it's located on their property so then the zoo comes in and does you know the permitting the design all that fun stuff and the install wow and they just they they get a, a, a free project uh, and, and what kind of cost is associated with creating? So there's collecting those shells is not free. Right. <laughs> the restaurants are, are kind enough to um, uh, donate donate them. Yeah. And the um, uh, Tourist Development Council, mm. Brevard County TDC, has supported the Shuck and Share program in the past, um, which helps defray that cost. But, it, you know, driving around the length of Brevard County is, <laughs> as you'd imagine, you know, it's a fair amount of gas. Gas and staff time, time, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's just that's just the first stage in the process. Right. You know, we have to collect those materials, put them in some kind of um, building block right. to move them out into the lagoon. We can't just like dump buckets of shell <laughs> randomly <laughs> right. in the lagoon and be like, good luck. You're right. Um, that's not how the and, and permits folks, work. Unfortunately. Yeah, please, please don't do that either. <laughs> yeah, don't uh, do yeah. that. Don't yeah. think you're getting yeah. like you know, uh, you know, <laughs> keeping your leftovers from from squid lips, and, and then like, <laughs> I'll just take it. Here, I'll, yeah. I'll, let me put it in my purse and then dump it yeah. out my no yeah so it, it's it's got to be a thing yeah, right? yeah yeah we call it the quarantine process you know okay. we don't we want to make sure the oysters you eat at a restaurant locally mm -hmm. they're not from the area right they're from the panhandle they're from texas they're from virginia they will not be from brevard county they right. will not be from the indian river lagoon so we don't want to introduce any potential pathogens mm -hmm. so we we have a very strict you know, is that why there's only 19 restaurants it seems like there'd be a lot more restaurants that served oysters well they have to choose to be in it it is some work for them and right. some training yeah. for their staff to participate so we um it's an opt-in program we're not hounding folks to get involved but we certainly want everyone's oyster shell if they would mm -hmm. give it to us sure um so yeah it's it's grown every year when we first started we were just getting from the shucking house mm -hmm. and like one one like red lobster in melbourne and it's grown in basically the past two and a half years to 19 restaurants and we'll probably right. add it like another five in the next year or so nice. so yeah well for those listening now's your opportunity call jake yeah. yeah if you if you own a restaurant or a manager in a restaurant and you serve oysters and you have those shells we want them <laughs> yes <laughs> join us yeah um, no we'll come pick them up once a week it's mm -hmm. not too much hassle for you. You just got to set them aside for us. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's just like anything else. So once the the mats are then prepared mm -hmm. yep. and the permits pulled and now they're essentially um, gone ahead and, and are actively doing their job. Yep. Um, how much water can a, an oyster filter? So the big talking point was always 50 gallons a day. Mm-hmm. Prob probably an overestimate, maybe mm -hmm. a gracious uh, math that was done there. Right. <laughs> um, oysters can get full. That's a pretty big oyster filtering for 24 hours a day, seven right. days a week. You know. So 50 gallons a day was the old talking point. It's probably mm -hmm. more in the range like maybe 25 to 30 gallons a day, but that's that's one oyster. Right. right. And wow, there's usually lot. not like one oyster when you see oysters. There's sure. dozens within you know a, a few inches. Mm -hmm. So um, the cumulative benefits are right. still great even if they don't filter quite as much as you know we well i think it, I, I think it was that one marketing image where you put a oyster in a very algae kind of uh, yeah. aquarium and then you know after yeah. the next day it was like clear yeah you um, can youtube it there's a yeah, bunch yeah. of great filtration <laughs> videos out <laughs> right. there yeah but there's i mean but the river is such a big basin 
And yes. it goes all the way to, you know, St. John's and Mosquito and all the way yep. down, to all the way to, 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 I think, Jupiter. Like, I mean, it's just such yeah, a long... Pa- the IRL lagoon. goes from Jupiter Inlet to Ponce Inlet. Yeah. So five counties, like a little tiny bit of a sixth county down mm-hmm. there in the south. Right. Now, when I said that oysters are not the end-all, be-all, sure. the, the goal in the county's plan there is 20 miles of oyster reef. Which wow. is a lot. You know, 20 miles like, you of oyster reef is a lot. 14 mm-hmm. acres or something of, right. of oyster reef over the, the life of the, the funding source. Mm-hmm. But that calculation is only going to filter the volume of the lagoon like maybe once a year. Mm-hmm. So that's an improvement, certainly, from where we're at. Mm-hmm. But that's not enough. So that's why I said this is right. a, a piece of a bigger plan. So if you look at the, the pie chart on the funding of the... Mm-hmm the county's plan the oyster and living shoreline piece is about three percent of the total funding so this is this is a small piece in the big picture but it's one that most of the homeowners might have an opportunity to participate with and who would they contact as a homeowner if they're interested well they can hop on our website mm-hmm. um, restore our mm-hmm. so that's the Bre- brevard zoos restoration program mm-hmm. within our conservation department so they can go right there and there's a volunteer tab and it has all the sign-up sheets. If you want to grow the baby oysters that get put on these projects, this mm-hmm. is another opportunity. So if you live in a canal and it might not be suitable for a, a permanent home for an oyster reef, mm-hmm. you can grow them and they will grow just fine up in the water column. You get to babysit them and clean mm-hmm. the cage a little bit, <laughs> make sure they're all happy. And then they go in kind of their forever home mm-hmm. on, a, on a reef when we build it. So. All those sign-up sheets are there. Um, we have a project um, funded through St. John's right now for clam restoration as well. Wow. So that gives us an opportunity to do work in more areas than are just suitable for oysters. Mm-hmm. Like I was saying, in the north end of the county, gets a, a little bit more challenging for oysters. Mm-hmm. Great clam habitat. Nice and salty, a lot less tributaries, a little bit more wave energy. Mm-hmm. Clams dig it up there. Yeah. So if you're in Titusville mm-hmm. or Coco. Um, Port St. John, wow. Port Canaveral, all those areas, yeah. pretty good clam habitat. So we have a grant right now, and we are looking for 100 different properties <laughs> right. uh, you know, for people to, again, get a, a free project that's going to benefit the lagoon. Well, here you go. I mean, you know, Space Coast, Brevard County, residents, uh, there's your invitation to get involved and, you know, do a little bit more than just have a a uh, pier or an extension of your property out into the river. Now you could absolutely help uh, your home, and you know I'm not sure if that's if that helps with appreciation uh, for your property. <laughs> but if someone really really loves you know fishing and and wants to be a part of that and have that legacy of hosting oysters, um, mm-hmm. yeah, certainly you know they may pick your home over the other neighbor who doesn't. So you never know. Yeah, if you're if you're a fisherman, I mean, when you're out on your boat doing some you know backwater fishing and mm-hmm. inshore stuff. Um, you go to the mangrove fringe, right? Right. You yeah. don't necessarily fish along the seawall. You look for some structure, right. natural or or not, that, that's where the fish are. So if you build really? an oyster reef, that adds a ton of structure that all the little critters are hanging out in. Exactly. Mm-hmm. The little crabs, the little shrimp, the little fish. And that attracts, as you'd bigger expect, fish. the bigger fish. Right. Well, so, well, yeah. Especially the drum family. Your redfish, yeah. your sheep's yeah. head. Because these are guys who actually forage on the bottom and, and they have yep. strong jaws that crack mm-hmm. through shells and, and completely, you know, just, just love where you're at. So, yeah, if you love snook, redfish, mangroves mm-hmm. are some of the best habitat ever. Yeah. So it, this is something that we've lost, unfortunately, over time. You know, mm-hmm. we have... 61% of our shoreline is armored in some way. So mm-hmm. that's coquina shorelines or seawalls. Right. And so we've lost some of that natural infrastructure right. that grows the fish that we like to eat and the crabs mm-hmm. that we like to you know, hunt for. Exactly. So, um, But there is there is a movement with the living shoreline. And mm-hmm. I was actually um, I had a, a unique uh, opportunity to um, provide music and, and uh, as people who know me, you know, that's kind of what I do. I, I, I DJ and MC different events. And we had uh, Tortoise Island hosted yeah. a, um, a Living Shoreline event. And of course, you know, we all came out, the MRC, and River Lagoon, like everybody who's anybody, Brevard Zoo was there and showed everybody like how to fish responsibly all the way to how to, you know, create a mat. And I think they even had some live mats and, you know, where you could yep. participate and, um, and getting away because, you know, a lot of those sloop, those sloping backyards just end right into the like, like it just dis- disappears it's like the in, like an infinite pool just disappears over the lead there's like an infinite lawn that just uh, disappeared right into the lagoon and guess what all that runoff of course it's beautiful green lawn 
right into the river. Um, so what they what they were encouraging people is to add a native shoreline, mm-hmm. you know, with with some kind of grass or something else to capture. And you know, you add some uh, pebbles and some rocks and some shells. That way, it okay. it doesn't go all the way to the river. Right, it, it 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 falls into the sand or the sediment and is actually captured before it goes all the way. Do you guys have anything to do with that program? We're so we do okay. living shorelines. So right. if you have um, a fairly natural shoreline, kind mm-hmm. of the sandy slope up into right. your uplands, the dry part of your property. We do mangrove and marsh grass plantings. Wow, so really? We, we do that as well. Okay. Uh, Marine Resources Council does also. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I, I think a couple Yeah, yeah. Uh, organizations. They and us would probably be the two okay. biggest ones in the area for um, for those types of projects. If you go further north out of the county into Volusia mm-hmm. or further south, there's some other um, nonprofits and other sure. groups that do the work. Um And then bioswales and some of the other stuff you're talking about, like that stormwater buffer. That, right. That... that um, no, that's exactly uh, what it is. Yeah, it's like yeah. a buffer planting where right. you're just trying to slow that water down and capture those nutrients and um, sediments before they get into the lagoon. Mm-hmm. Um, Satellite Beach has a program for that. We're right. trying to we're looking into a grant opportunity for that as well to make it more accessible to homeowners because there are plenty of people who are interested in this but don't have the expertise or don't know what plants to pick and aren't sure what the design might be. And there's not exactly a cottage industry in the landscaping community right now for this. There should be. I wish there was. There should be. But um, we're trying to see if there's an opportunity there to to make it a bit more accessible to homeowners. So that might happen later this year, maybe next Mm. year. So if you had a homeowner that was interested in that, but maybe whatever reason, they weren't necessarily interested in planting or doing the work. Who does that kind of work? Do, is that volunteers or their their paid staff that come in and do the yeah. plantings and things, or At, is that something that you need, can uh, use volunteers for? I'm not sure how many of the municipalities have something similar. I believe Satellite Beach's program is reimbursement based. So if if you pay to have someone do it, a landscaping contractor mm-hmm. or somebody, mm-hmm. or do it yourself, Satellite Beach will reimburse you a certain dollar value right. on the size of the project. Um, we're trying to expand that with a, a potential grant to say you know the plants will be covered the design the install will be covered you just mm-hmm. basically have to give we're trying to make this as easy right, and right. accessible as possible so who's in installing it now is it primarily the homeowner then yeah for, okay. for most of these would be um if you're doing living shoreline something funded through the county it's usually whoever's put in for that that contract mm-hmm. with the county okay. through the sorrel plan so right. the zoo or mrc okay. um, would come in and do the whole install and the plant selection and everything permitting if if needed and all that fun stuff and then that's great because again the homeowner just just right. kind of gets to show up i was just trying to think of something yeah. you know if there's somebody that lives on the mainland that doesn't have shorefront property yes. but would like to get involved yeah there are some small um smaller landscaping companies um that do more of that work where they focus on natives and focus on stuff mm-hmm. like right. you were discussing that doesn't need um, to be babied quite as right. much with fertilizer and, and pesticides or herbicides, you know, whatever you need right. to do to kind of keep the, the pretty exotics right. happy. There's right. some really nice native, you know, exotics oh, yes. looking plants that you can get. And yeah. absolutely. And not only that, but the, the, the natives attract your butterflies and yep. all of your other natural insects. Yep. This is this is the habitat that they're used to as well. So if you like seeing, you know, again, all kinds of different butterflies in your yard and everything else, plant just some some na- native vegetation, and they will yeah. they will come. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but they they don't need fertilizer. This is where they're supposed to grow. Mm-hmm. So they grow freely just with the the rain, the soil, and the sunlight. That's that's the only things mm-hmm. that these plants have grown for millennia. So yeah. it's like, you know, if you plant them again, they'll, they know what to do. Yeah. Happy in drought during the drought part of the year, happy during rainy season. Yep. Um, and then you get the zebra long wings and the Gulf fritillaries yes. and the monarchs and all the fun little butterflies that we have. So locally. I'm glad I have a guy from the zoo who knows all the, <laughs> the species of butterflies and everything else. So John, you've been quiet and I've been talking so much. So you, you, you have anything um, to add? Yeah. I want to learn more about seagrass because I've yeah. heard mm-hmm. horrible stories about like manatees passing away due yeah. to starvation and... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is a pretty bad year to be a manatee. Mm-hmm. Um, so they just declared an unusual mortality event in Florida, particularly on, on our side, the East Coast. Yeah. And that means that there is a um, higher than normal rate of manatee deaths 
Um, and the big indicator from FWC who does um, the necropsies, who looks at the animals right. when they've passed away, uh, is that they're underweight, they're emaciated, they're starving. Um, so that's not good. Um, it's a little odd because we really lost a good chunk of our seagrass in 2011 during the, f the first big algae bloom we had, where mm. it kind of bloomed across the whole section of Brevard County, the super bloom. That yeah. was the big fish kill, right? Yeah, that was a big fish kill that year. We had the, uh, when we had another in 2016. Mm. Um, and we've had algae blooms not quite every year mm. since then, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014. We had some brown tides starting then. Yeah, I remember that. We had a little gap in 2015. Yeah. 2016, we got hit hard again, and that was the other big fish kill. And then that yep. was kind of the push for the sorrel plan. Um, people got to see firsthand what happens when <laughs> the lagoon is going in the wrong direction. Right. Uh, and that kind of pushed us um, to pass that funding. So, yeah, tough year for the manatees. I think uh, the state is is kind of running around like crazy right now trying to figure out what can be done. Mm. I know FWC is is working hard. Is it still going in the wrong direction or is it starting to go in the right direction? It is mixed. <laughs> <laughs> there's not a there's not a, an easy answer. So the lagoon's pretty big, right? So it's the Indian River Lagoon's 156 miles long. There's a lot of components long. to that answer. Yeah, so um, for us what we should see is I think Brevard County had like 45,000 acres of seagrass and that was a couple different species that we had locally there's like four of the main species there's seven in the IRL um, seven seagrass species how and do we they determine four. that? Uh, St. John's does aerial mapping and then they do ground truthing so uh. they look at density of the bed like how many mm -hmm. plants are in you know a square meter or whatever um, and then they do aerial mapping to get kind of the big coverage so they do that every two years and they had the 2009 we hit peak seagrass we hit the amount of seagrass that their oldest aerial maps from the 40s from the early flyovers from like patrick where they thought we had about 45,000 acres we hit that in 2009 and then we just tanked Oof. right after that which is pretty tough and a little bit of recovery in 2013 and we've kind of just been eking along every you know two years since so the 2019 map came out last year you know they do the survey in 19 mm -hmm. and they publish it in 20 and we're still kind of struggling we have seen a little bit more seagrass in some areas and a species that we're not as not as used to seeing down south has mm -hmm. kind of been moving up because we had a really dry winter and dry spring so it's it's happy it's migrating up the water's mm -hmm. been moderately clear after that algae bloom this um last winter kind of wrapped up is that food for the manatees as it, well it is good but it's it's a tiny seagrass oh mm -hmm. you know w when we manatees think of the ones big. that manatees like they like the big long oh. stringy ones there's a bunch of species that make this really long blade mm -hmm. and get this really dense canopy of seagrass and really fill in and make a bed you know if you've ever snorkeled right. in the keys and like the turtle grass of course, right. where it's yeah. just this meadow of grass as far as you can see the species that we have that is present right now is just doesn't grow that yeah. big or that dense. It's just mm -hmm. kind of, it, it's there. It's some seagrass. So we were happy about that, but it's not enough to feed, you know, feed the manatees and recover to where, where we needed to be, but it's something, you know, it might be a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So That's interesting. yeah, it's, it's a tough time for so the So can you go out and just like play with this grass? I mean, <laughs> so funny story. Um, we started a project to look into that basically. Um, one of the mechanisms of seagrass, they do, um, fertilize and have seeds mm -hmm. underwater oh, which cool. is kind of fascinating yeah. right. um so they can spread by seeds but actually one of the the main mechanisms for a lot of them is when manatees or something is foraging they break off fragments mm -hmm. and they float around and then they'll land, land. again and reroot, and that helps them colonize new areas and mm -hmm. then they just grow like normal and expand so we can collect those floating fragments and then replant them to kind of start little pioneer beds nice. so um we started a project with that during COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, that was an interesting project, but um, we still got some volunteers involved. Some some of the teens from the zoo um, got to come out with us and, and help monitor that project. Um, the big problem is uh, that the water quality is still pretty bad. Yeah. Um, so there's everyone, including the state and the county, is very hesitant about spending a, a million dollars, $5 million on a big seagrass project. Right. And then 
that summer we have an algae bloom and, and there's no dies. light getting to the bottom and the seagrass dies because they're, they're a plant. They need light to photosynthesize. Right. Exactly. So it's, uh, everyone's moving cautiously trying to. Seems like a big risk. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's a bunch of groups involved though. FWC, the zoo, um, St. John's River Water Management District, Harbor Branch down south um, that are looking at ways to do this in kind of smaller cost effective ways mm -hmm. so that if we think that we can you know have good confidence that it's going to survive we'll plant a whole bunch right it seems like um none, none of it's an an easy task it's all very daunting and it takes lots of organizations to make it happen yeah it, in the lagoons complex i mean right. we're, we were talking before we got started today exactly. about you know how the lagoon flows and and the inlet you know question that people have and it's just it, there's not always an easy answer unfortunately well it's because it's so long yeah. And there are so many issues. And it's constantly changing, too, just with weather. You know, we've been dry. Mm. Yep. So that affects the climate and the mm -hmm. environment of the, the water. I'm itself, sure storms and hurricanes can affect the... Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so the lagoon is very... I don't want to say finicky. That's not the right term. It's very dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a system that's meant to be dynamic right mm -hmm. you have the mix of the fresh water you have the mix of the salt water that makes it you know a brackish water system yeah and then you know a hurricane comes and changes the whole <laughs> water level and dumps yeah. a bunch of fresh water yeah and then right after that you know late season hurricane we go into dry season and the whole lagoon you know, evaporates yep. down and concentrates the salt and then we get real salty for a mm -hmm. bit yeah it's a it's a very interesting place to work in the river lagoon st john's and and all these other um connecting tributaries because you know we have a bunch of fresh water you know from mm -hmm. st john's and there's you know there's there's tributaries coming from the northern end of the county and everything else and you know you also have um even like uh lake washington and some other big bodies of water not too far inland yeah and there's uh you know again when it ru when those areas get too high during the wet season you know guess where it goes you know all the way to the lagoon the lagoon has a little bit to where to go and it is it is just a, a constant changing and but it's but it's also been recognized as one of the most vibrant diverse ecosystems in the country so i think it's our opportunity to help out and so you know giving a call to action to any of the residents here any volunteers that want to go to the brevard zoo um we've already given them a, a way to do that you know we're gonna re we're gonna make sure we remind them uh because you don't have to live on the river to do your part Okay. Um, again, we're, it's an action call to all the restaurants, you know, that serve oysters. You know, mm -hmm. they they can become part of the pro, uh, the program, and um, and it's really just people with a shoreline, you know, to, to or anyone that wants to help. Yeah, but you know, if if if, if it's if it's the the buffer, um, if it's planting natives and getting rid of your lawn, I mean, there's so many opportunities for people, and then and I think that's the the point of of today's episode is to let people know that there is an option. There, there are ways for you to participate, um, but let's let's go back to to the zoo and and uh, is there any summer programs uh, that people can can come to? I mean, are, yes. is it is there always a, a mat building uh, you know <laughs> yeah. operation going on, or is it specifically certain times? So it, it's seasonal. So okay. um, if if you want to come to the zoo mm. and and learn about animals and and learn about um, nature and getting outside our education department has some great mm. programs they are filling up quick good their virtual ones have a more uh, gracious capacity we'll say yeah <laughs> so um check that out you can mm. find all that info on the brevardzoo.org website um if you want to get your hands dirty yes. and come out and volunteer with us um there's an opportunity for every uh, age and mm. ability level um if you have a green thumb or even like a maybe not so green thumb, mm -hmm. um, you can grow mangroves with us through the adopt a mangrove project. Um, take yeah. the little babies home. I did that. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Grow them up. They grow crazy slow, mm -hmm. but, um, many groups, including us have found if you put the little babies out, there's a reason there's tons of little baby mangroves floating around because right. not many of them are going to make it. Right. <laughs> so it's an ad adaptive strategy there. Mm -hmm. So if we can grow them nice and big, then we'll plant them and they have a lot better chance of surviving. Exactly. So, um, you can do that. You can grow baby oysters with us with the mm -hmm. oyster gardening project. Um, you can come and, and volunteer to do the sweat equity, the labor of sure. building our, our materials. We mm -hmm. do that in the cool months on purpose right. <laughs> um, because it's tough, tough right. work out in, the, yeah, out in the sun and heat, um, bagging up oyster shells. Right. Um, 
And then of course we need hands to put all this stuff in the water. So mm. that is um, a little more focused on the summertime because that's when we build our projects in the lagoon because that's mm. oyster breeding season. What um, about the boating community? Can the boating community yeah. help out in any way? Yeah. People with of, boats? Of course. Um, we have been targeting most of our um, oyster reef builds and our plantings in areas where we can get to it by vehicle. Right. And we do you know, um, contract a barge when we need to bring in a lot of materials into a mm-hmm. spot that's maybe not as accessible. Um, but in the past and potentially again soon in the future, mm-hmm. we're going to be working on sites that are not as accessible. And so if there's folks with boats who want to volunteer their time and their nice. captain abilities <laughs> sure. um i would then, yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> then we'd love to have that as well in particular for some of the clam projects mm-hmm. they're not as material heavy mm-hmm. you know we're taking you know a couple buckets of clams out and spreading right. them out and you know kind of you know, staking them in place um so those are material light we'll yes. say compared to the oyster reef where we're bringing out you know a thousand bags of, of oyster shell so wow. that's a great opportunity for somebody who's got a boat that wants to um, come out with us and plant a few sites nice yeah Excellent. And then uh, any final closing thoughts regarding uh, the populations of fish? You know, we already talked about manatees, but is there anything else that we need to do? Or is there a moratorium? I know, you know, we encourage fishermen to only uh, bag what, what is in a slot, you know, and, and so forth. But are we seeing a decline in, in other river species or, or maybe an improvement? Well, it's different, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, back in the day, maybe 10 years ago, people came here for sea tra- uh, spotted sea trout. Mm-hmm. They right. came here for redfish. Yes. And that, those are seagrass dependent Exa- exactly. species. And well, that's how, where their legs, uh, yeah. you know, where their, their, yeah. their, they would lay the eggs. Yeah. And yeah. that was the, the, uh, the, the uh, I don't, it's not the breeding ground, but it's it's the it, the uh, fertility ground. It, it is, yeah. yeah. So seagrass meadows and mangrove forests are great mm. nursery habitat. Nursery, for, that's what I was looking for. For yeah. all the you know all the little species, the mm-hmm. small game fish before they get big. Sure. I mean, snook love mangrove creeks and yes. all that tarpon go into the mosquito impoundments mm-hmm. and the mangrove creeks and stormwater pond, all that stuff. Right. So. Um, Check the regulations, obviously. I mean, all, all fishermen know that one. Mm-hmm. Um, or else FWC yeah, will be yeah, all over yeah, you. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> FWC will get you. Uh, <laughs> but um, just kind of understand that what you're fishing for has probably changed. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've fished here in the 90s and the early 2000s, yeah. you're... Yeah, we were talking about that earlier yeah. when I was a little kid. There was oyster yeah. beds and clam beds everywhere, and you could just go and rake them up like, like Easter eggs. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah. now they're not here. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, FWC did some mapping in the early 2000s, and this this blows the mind. They mm-hmm. they went out to map where the clams were and weren't to look at what what made this good clam habitat, so they could make the shellfish harvesting areas for sure. recreation and commercial guys. And they found like 200 clams, you know, in in, uh, in a one square meter. You know, mm-hmm. you're talking like a three foot by three foot section. They found like 200 clams in like 2004. Right. When when That's UF Whitney Lab, Dr. Todd Osborne's team went out to collect the the clams that started the the super clam you know mm-hmm. project, the IRL clam restoration that we're we're doing with them, they put a thousand man hours in and found like thirty nine in like <laughs> the whole wow. like whole north part of the lagoon because wow. the yeah. the whole system's different. Right. right. So, um, we've sh- we've had some changes. It's not to say mm-hmm. that we can't recover, and we're mm-hmm. we're trying our best you know the national estuary program the indian river lagoon council um the state the county and a bunch of our nonprofit partners are really doing our best and you know anything you can do to help taking that that little action whatever Mm -hmm. it is not fertilizing getting a rain barrel planting Mm -hmm. a shoreline just volunteering right um that's all great that that's a step an incremental step in the right direction for us Mm -hmm. yeah Another quick question, talking about the chemicals and stuff, not just with the lawn fertilizers, but I've also heard a lot with just the cleaning products within the home, you know, um, laundry detergents, soaps, things like that, that go into obviously probably more like those with septic tanks. So what are some things that homeowners can do there? Well, so first off, if if you're on sewer, Sewer. you you don't get a free pass. Mm -hmm. Wastewater treatment plants are are processing that for you and you're you're paying for it. so um, understand that all, all that water gets used again. So just because it goes to a wastewater treatment plant and gets treated, they use that 
you know, reclaimed water mm -hmm. to, you know, irrigate and medians and stuff, that, mm -hmm. that still makes its way back into the lagoon. It just takes a, a longer a route. Longer. Right. right. If you have a septic tank, get it serviced on a regular schedule. Mm -hmm. The point of a septic system is for public health. It's to remove potential pathogens, you know, E. coli and stuff that's going to make people sick. It is not to remove nutrients. No. Which right. is why that one little patch where the septic tank is is like s the greenest part of the lawn because right. <laughs> it's just leaching nutrients <laughs> like crazy. Yeah. So um, septic tanks were built for a different purpose um, than removing nutrients. So get them uh, regularly maintained. And if you live very close to the lagoon, you know, proximity matters, the county right. found. If you're like 200 feet, I believe. Yeah, 200 right. feet contributes some portion, you know, within you know whatever it is. 50 feet contributes like a bunch. Right. But if you're more than 200 feet from the lagoon, your septic tank, even if it's pretty broken, is is not contributing nearly as much as someone with a, a pretty decent septic tank mm. right near the water. Right. That right. groundwater, you know, that is leaching. That that sheet flow of water mm. when it rains just pulls all those nutrients and dumps them in. Yeah, because I believe there's um now a moratorium on the regular septic design and now you need more of a yeah, aerator I, I think yeah, aerobic it's temporary design. right so right, it's not right. a ban it's a moratorium it's a temporary right. pause on new construction within a certain proximity to exactly. um the lagoon and the thinking is that they'll probably up the the expectations on mm. how good your system needs to be so there's some it, they call them advanced septic systems right. they filter out 60 percent of the nitrogen and phosphorus something like that wow which is Notably better than uh, what the zero or five yeah, percent <laughs> that they that the yeah, conventional yeah, septic does. Right. So it's a step in the right direction, but uh, again, there's where so possible many old we ones. want. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I've heard there's some grants to either get new septic tanks or possibly to get in, you know, routed onto the sewer, the city sewer. Yeah, so that's through the Sorrel plan as well. The mm -hmm. the county's um, Save Our Indian River Lagoon plan. And it's based on the, the cost, right? right? Right. So if you're more than 200 feet away, it's not really worth the cost of upgrading that system. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so if you're close, they'll do septic upgrades in some instances. And where cost effective, they'll put a sewer line in. Mm -hmm. That's the best option, but right. that's very expensive. So they need a certain density of people in a, a line nearby that they can tap into. Right. If you... If you ever want a 200-page mm. read, <laughs> I encourage you to check out the county's plan because it's mm. it's quite in depth and goes through the whole decision science of mm. you know how do we spend our money effectively, right. so that we're not just you know throwing money into a pit that is the lagoon and, and hoping that it, you know we we fixed it. And not, and not for nothing, you know when it does sunset now and you know we're getting closer you know yeah, i think 26 20, 26 seven. or 27 yeah. something like that so when it sunsets and and then we evaluate okay did any of that effort help yeah you know and if and if the data shows that you know maybe it didn't then we're probably not going to continue it and we're, and it's just going to go into more despair until again there's another event yeah you know like a big algae bloom and then everybody gets excited about it and then we go through another bill or you know legislation to, to tax um but i really hope that after the 10 years we could see some really good positive data and go you know what guys it's just a half a cent now people mm -hmm. now it's not a true like half a penny yeah. but it's a half a percent so it's still it's still a tax um on your purchasing but if people are confident absolutely confident no question about it it works then I know me as a taxpayer would have no problem doing it. And I think the, I agree the, the thing of the general census as well, right. like, wow, we found something that works. Oh, well, let's c yeah. continue the dredging. Let's continue the oyster mats. Let's yeah. continue the living shoreline. Yeah, actually working on something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So well, that's why we have oversight. It's benefiting, yeah. For yeah. perspective, so the EPA program, the National Estuary Program, mm -hmm. that, that helps manage this whole water body across right. all these counties and all these different municipalities, I want to say their annual budget is like three or four million dollars for like the whole lagoon. That's let's, not a lot. Let's, let's call it five. Right. You know, with us, with this funding for funding um, source that we set aside mm. for ourselves, that is a that is a tax that we've taken on and a gift to ourselves. Right. Because that money only goes into Brevard Waters. Right. right. And that's what forty eight million on average a year for ten years. That's. It's, if we got every bit of funding from the National Ashery Program, right. it probably wouldn't be enough. So we got to be putting in some local dollars exactly. here right. as well. Well, it's also um, improving our our value for our properties. 
Oh yeah. You know, as far as aid, real estate is concerned. Well, nobody wants waterfront property oh. on a dead body yeah. of water. Or <laughs> looks like chocolate milk or, or pea soup. Or <laughs> smells. Or, yeah. 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 It smells. You know, and, um, dead fish. And, and, and not for nothing, you know, there are retention ponds. Right. Mm-hmm. Which are not waterfront, which are, you know, it's just it's just yeah. a place for, you know, storm water to go to so it doesn't flood your house. Um, but, you know, even even things will survive in there. You'll see lily pads. You'll mm-hmm. see a whole, whole little arc, you know, mm-hmm. ecosystem happening and just any of these uh, new communities that are going up. And, you know, it's, it's a mitigation effort. It's just like, well, you know, you could say you got waterfront property, but it's really just the developer needing to have, you yeah. know, somewhere for the water Storm to water go. Control. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, but, but again, the turtles, they'll find it. The snakes, mm-hmm. the gators, yeah. the yeah. birds, they will find. Yeah. Yeah. It's still habitat. It's, it's still, still habitat. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Um, we, we have a, a real opportunity right. um, in the next few years to make progress. Exactly. I think we are moving in the right direction. The seagrass might not show it yet. Right. Um, but if we have a, a couple good years where there's lots of light getting to the bottom, mm-hmm. where we have nice sandy bottom, where we've done the muck dredging, where right. we've done some of that hard work, man, exactly. it'll bounce back quick. Um, I think you'll be surprised Mm-hmm. I'm really, really confident, right. <laughs> you know, 2027, we'll say, okay, we're moving in the right direction. Things are getting better. And I hope mm-hmm. that encourages us to keep, you know, the effort going and not just say, all right, we did it. You Nature know, Nature has a way yeah. of correcting itself. Yeah. Yeah. So I just hope that the efforts that were planned and mapped out, again, now like going on its fourth, fifth year, I really hope by um, that it catches up with all the population that's also contributing to even more of the same right yeah. i mean you know more and more communities more and more building more and more of everything right because uh, a lot of times it'll coach on wetlands and other parts that you know not for nothing um uh are are able to again you know heal itself and 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 maintain some kind of homeostasis but as soon as we go in with the bulldozers and start moving you know sand around and habitats are moved and trees and, and everything Building else you know walls and all of it all of yeah. it combined so i'm wondering if if a five-year-old plan had the foresight you know the the you know the the amount of um you know whatever crystal ball that they were able to have at the time yeah. and go well guys you know does this does this sustain even with a two, three, or even four percent population growth, year over year over year, you know, until it sunsets, you know, so is it aggressive enough? Is what I'm saying, you know. I mean, so I guess we'll we can only learn that after, you know, someone says, well, we grew by you know, twenty thousand more people, you know, fifteen hundred more homes, and we're still able to maintain, you know, some some positive, you know, um, a result then man you know i think that you know we'll be way ahead of ourselves and and hopefully into a, a really good direction yeah so the number i heard thrown around pre covid mm-hmm. was that 900 people a day were moving to florida yes. so that's not only brevard county right it's spread out but the space industry seems to be pretty booming absolutely and our engineering firms seem to be doing quite well so i'm imagining that we're getting a decent mm-hmm. you know proportion of, of those 900 a day right people that number may here. have gone up i actually during covid it probably could yeah yeah um I, you guys would probably know better than, than me on that that number has gone up yeah <laughs> <laughs> perfect yeah yeah so um there are things that we can control right here in our county you know with the, the sorrel plan and there's things we can't so you sure. know the state and the feds have to do their their part as yeah, well we yeah, all yeah. we all gotta you know be pitching in um one of the benefits of how the plan was built was that it is adaptable, though, to, to your comment of, right. you know, we make a plan in 2016 and then in 2027 when it's finished up, do we stay on the right path? Right, right. So each year they look at the projects that they've funded, the projects that are pending, and how much money that they have contracted out and what they expect to come in. Right. And they reevaluate. And, and both the county commissioners and the citizen oversight committee can make recommendations and changes to the plan. So we had a big, I'll call it a realignment mm-hmm. um, in the first like two years. We had a huge pot of money stuck in right. um, muck that. dredging. Yeah. Yes. And people were not interested in spending, you know, two, three hundred million dollars, whatever it was, just yeah. on muck dredging. And so they reallocated a mm. bunch of that funding into other programs that would have more uh, more spread out. It'd be a little bit more equitable across right. the length of the county instead of just a few big muck deposits getting mm-hmm. dredged 
like Ogali River and up by the Barrow Pits by like 520 and all right. that. And so each year it gets reassessed to mm-hmm. make sure we are spending our money effectively, right. which I appreciate as a taxpayer. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, this has been plenty, plenty insightful. Um, it's so glad to get an update from, you know, Brevard Zoo, um, a really big, not only um, amenity here in Brevard County, it is a uh, it is an attraction in itself and because you guys are doing over and beyond with rehabilitating sea life to, mm-hmm. to also contributing to um, you know any effort to help the Indian in, in River Lagoon um, it's just uh, you know from all of us you know thank you so much for the efforts yeah uh, thank any, you guys yeah, other? super inspiring I, yeah. I, yeah. I hope nice. it inspires people that want to get involved like it has inspired me to want to get involved Definitely. Yeah. yeah it's a great place to live and mm-hmm. you know so we're, we're happy to be in this community we have a great opportunity here. <laughs> yeah, but it's up <laughs> to all of us. You yeah. know, we, I mean, yeah. it's, it's it takes it takes effort, and yeah. for you know, for people because because I, I know it when it comes around the algae bloom, almost everybody has an opinion. But when things are good and like you know, right now we're at a pretty good homeostasis. You know, yep. you think fish are jumping, dolphins are rolling, yeah. and it's like you know the sun goes up and down. But at the end of the day, how much? How much are you really excited about it? And to accept, you know, when you get a, a, this, these inflammatory headlines, like you know, mm-hmm. you know, dead manatees and and, and fish kills and everything yeah. else. So I really hope the, the you know the listener uh, takes that initiative because I think you've given an abundant amount of ways Definitely. to participate. So find one yourself, guys, mm-hmm. and um, get and involved. What, get whatever involved. you can do, even if it's just like taking half your lawn and <laughs> dedicating it. <laughs> To natives, I mean, seriously, whatever it yeah. takes. Um, you know, if you live canal front or, or you know, are, are on the river, you have a unique opportunity um, to, to also keep an eye on, you know, your shorelines. Very so, impactful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and the most benefit to gain. Exactly. <laughs> That's it, too. Yeah. Exactly. Imagine going up just off your dock and, you know, bring your grandkid and throwing the lion in and mm-hmm. immediately you're, you're, you know, lining up with some, some you know, beautiful, yeah. uh, you know, Florida fish. Yeah. And um, not for nothing, but if it's a keeper, you know, enjoy your dinner. You yeah. know, and, and uh, I mean, it'd in be nice clean, to be able to. Clean river. Yeah, yeah. Right. It'd, be, it'd be really nice to harvest, you know, a, a meal uh, without being worried about, you know, where it comes from or, or um, anyway, it's just, yeah. uh, it just, it just be nice to, to, to bring back that nostalgia, you right. know, of, of, yeah. of just enjoying a, a really nice river. I think we would all look forward to uh, being able to walk out into the lagoon and collect a bucket of clams. Yeah, again. that'd be great. I mean, that'd be awesome. Have a clam bake on the Spoil mm-hmm. Islands. Right. Yeah, you know, just. I mean, just live that Florida lifestyle. Yeah, that was yeah. in the 80s, and we were on one of those spoiled islands, and they were just surrounded by clams and oysters mm-hmm. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and and again, it's you know you can't go blame you know um, uh, generations of the past for for overfishing or anything else. You know that's yeah. that's 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 not the story anymore. The story yeah. is now we have the opportunity to do it ourselves and make this generation, yeah. you know, the generation that imp- improves it for for our you know, kids our, exactly. Our kids, right, yeah. and exactly. everybody kids can get involved in some kids. some way or another. So. I'm going to go ahead and fade us out and um, and say goodbye. But before that, Jake, how can people um, contact you and get involved one last time? Yeah, so go to the Restore Our Shores website. So that's www.restoreourshores.org. And under the volunteer tab, there's a bunch of opportunities where you can sign up for. Stay in touch, join our newsletter, and come check out the zoo. Support us that way as well. We love that. Awesome. And this has been another episode of the Space Coast Real Estate Show. Thanks so much for tuning in and uh, make sure to go back and listen to our previous episodes. And of course, uh, like the uh, Facebook page and you won't miss another episode coming up. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.